Hello, and welcome to World History. Today, we're going to be dis continuing to discuss the effects of the French Revolution by traveling back to Europe and looking at how the ideology and the ideas of the French Revolution continued to spread even after the revolution itself was over. So today, we're going to talk about the volcano of 1848 and all the revolts that erupted as various other people looked at what the French Revolution had accomplished and said, well, what if we could do the good things of the French Revolution without having to deal with the bad things of the French Revolution? So the, the, the phrase, the volcano, comes from a writer named Alexis de Tocqueville. And he basically describes this situation where there's all this pressure building up and then all of this discontent eventually is going to explode like a volcano. And as we talk about these elections, or these, uh, as we talk about all of these revolutions, hopefully you can see why the people thought that this was a somewhat good metaphor to describe this. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand who conservatives are, who liberals are, and who radicals are. You're going to look at the pressures building in Europe before the revolution. Then we're going to look specifically at France and how the French Revolution continued, it basically repeated itself in miniature in the 1830s and 1840s. And then we're gonna look at our good friend Clements von Metternich and how his fall from power kicked off this whole new wave of revolution and change. So let's dive in. As you hopefully remember, the French Revolution was able to spread its ideas so widely because in general, because the French by building this massive arm, this massive army, and by uniting the French people, were able to conquer almost all of Europe. And so, after the French Revolution, we basically divide up our different uh, political groups into three different categories. On the one hand, you have conservatives who oppose change. They're generally nobles. They generally have significant amounts of money and power. They're the absolute rulers of Austria and Prussia. Clements von Metternich fits into this category. And when they think about the revolution and uh, you know, political representation, what they see is the chaos created by the French Revolution. Then you've got the liberals. We talked a little bit about the Industrial Revolution and how all these factories started popping up. And so the people who owned these factories generally had money and they had education, but they were often not nobles. And so because they weren't nobles, they were not allowed to participate in government. They were obviously locked out of the top spot, who's the king, you know, taken by the king. And generally, kings chose other nobles for their governmental positions. And so for liberals, what they wanted was to limit the power of the king and participate in government. But they didn't want to turn the world upside down because, quite frankly, they were benefiting from a lot of the changes that were coming to Europe. And then you've got the radicals. The radicals are in general lower class workers. Uh, they're generally poor and they generally do not have access to resources. And so what they want is the system to change because they feel like they're being exploited by these factories and by these factory owners. And they don't like the liberals who are pushing for limited amounts of change. They wanna make everyone politically equal and also maybe answer the social question and try to make people socially equal by redistributing wealth. So we're going to see, hopefully you'll be able to see echoes of these different ideologies in our story as we go forward. French Revolution sort of follows through this phase, through these phases, starting with a very conservative government, of course, the Ancien Regime. Then liberals take over through the whole tennis court oath and the, and the good revolution part. Then when the Jacobins take over, they try to make everyone equal. And then Napoleon takes over and basically returns everything back to conservatism. So keep all this in mind because you're going to see these stages somewhat repeat themselves as we go forward. Ascended during this time are the forces of order. Once the French Revolution was defeated, lots of conservatives wanted to prevent future revolutions because they saw them as turning into the French Revolution and creating chaos and death. And so hopefully, as you remember from last semester, Clements von Metternich here represented the forces of order and put together the Holy Alliance and the Concert of Europe, these sort of alliances of conservative rulers whose goal it was to put down these revolutions. So for the for approximately 20 years after the French Revolution, any attempt to um, agitate for any of this stuff was met with the iron fist of the established powers and the forces of order. There was strict censorship, 
these ideas were not spread. And it went, we went again for about two decades without really addressing any of the challenges or problems that the French Revolution was supposed to address, which of course doesn't mean that those problems go away, just that we haven't really done anything to try to appease the people who are upset by this. Metternich, of course, lays out his perfect vision for society with the great monarchs using their power to uh, rule effectively. And so he's, of course, as we see here, an advocate for design right and a powerful government with the king as an absolute ruler. Other forces that we start to see show up here are nationalism. Nationalism is the idea that a people with a similar language, culture, and heritage should try to unite together and push for their interest. And after seeing the effect of the French people uniting together, both to give people more representation and then, of course, to make France into an unstoppable war machine through the levee en masse, lots of other nations decided that they wanted their own states that could look out for their interests because otherwise they're a small minority people within a larger society and they can more easily be ignored. So a lot of these revolutions are nationalist revolutions to try to create countries for groups of people who don't already have them so they can sort of mirror the experience of the French and the English. As you can see here in a lot of the areas in which there were not major uh, nation states, you know, the Austrian Empire and what's eventually going to be Italy and Germany, these revolution, revolutions broke out there as people tried to create their own governments and their own countries that could look out for their interests. So keep that in mind as well. One of the other forces that led to this unrest is industrialization. The Industrial Revolution affected people differently. It kicked a lot of people off their land and moved them in to factories where they often struggled to make enough money to eat. And at the same time, Drought and uh, crop failures happened throughout the 40s, leading to a lot of suffering. And so for the lower classes of people who are struggling to survive and get by, they're pushing for change because literally they don't see a choice. Specifically, as the, after the potato famine hit, there was significant agitation because, of course, people are starving and they want to reorder society in order to help, help them survive, quite frankly. New, uh, new thinkers and philosophers started to create new ideas from this, the most famous of them being Karl Marx, who wrote the book The Communist Manifesto, where he argued that the lower class people, the workers, are the ones who are truly creating the value through their labor, and they should rise up and seize control. These ideas are, of course, going to become very influential later, so they're pushing for this brand of socialist equality that we'll see crop up here in our story in a minute, but just understand that it goes back to Marx and Engels, who are the ones who most clearly sort of uh, spread and articulate these ideas. So our story begins with the July Revolution. As you hopefully remember, after the French Revolution, the Bourbon dynasty was restored to the throne of France, namely the brothers of Louis the, Louis the 16th. So first, Louis the 18th takes the throne, and he is the older brother of Louis XVI, and he rules uneventfully for a few years, not taking any drastic steps because, again, he's worried about potentially having potentially outraging revolutionaries and leading to uh, you know unrest and problems. So, unfortunately, then Louis the, Louis XVIII dies without an heir, and his brother, the younger brother of Louis, Charles X, takes power. Charles X was an absolutely unreconstructed absolutist. And so he tried to wield power exactly the same way or in a similar way to how Louis XIV would have uh, wielded power a couple generations ago. He's going to put in strict censorship. He's going to dissolve the French parliament whenever he wants. He's going to change voting rules in order to, uh, in order to, in order to fix elections. And he's going to basically outrage the French people so much that they rise up to overthrow him in 1830. So the French people again raise the tricolor flag, take to the streets, barricade themselves in the city of Paris. Charles sends his army out into the streets of Paris only to have them trapped by these barricades. Charles's army then surrenders to the people of Paris and Charles himself is forced to flee. 
So the July Revolution with Charles fleeing Paris, the people decide or the people of Paris decide to overthrow him and instead enshrine his cousin, Louis Philippe, on the throne. And Louis Philippe agrees to be a limited monarch who's not going to censor, censor the people. The tricolor flag is coming back. He's promising not to fix elections and to basically rule like a constitutional monarch like they would have in England. And for a few years, that happens effectively. The problem is change doesn't happen fast enough. And all the pressures that we were talking about, the economic pressures, the pressures of the lower class to be able to vote, start to build. They start criticizing Louis Philippe for not being responsive enough to the will of the people. He starts passing censorship laws, which he promised not to do. A series of banquets turn into a political demonstration and then a revolution. And so again, this time in 1848, the people of Paris rise up yet again, overthrow Louis Philippe, and set up the Second French Republic, where there's no king and universal suffrage is the norm. Everyone can vote. At first, the Second French Republic tries to embrace radical principles. The new, par the new parliament, the new legislature is taken over by socialists like Louis Blanc, and they start setting up what they call the national workshops. This is a system of basically government-run workshops that guarantee work for everybody. But the people who are put in charge of these workshops don't necessarily believe in them, and they sort of sabotage the process. The other problem with the Second French Republic is it gives every single person in France the right to vote. And the end result of that is the average, the average French peasant isn't particularly educated about the issues of the day and can be persuaded by nationalistic images to vote for someone who might not totally represent their interest. So let me introduce to you Louis Napoleon, Napoleon's nephew and the future Napoleon III. Napoleon ran for president of France on a platform of one, I'm gonna restore France to glory just like my uncle did and two, he basically promised everyone a million unicorns or whatever else they wanted if they would vote for him. He made broad sweeping promises that he had no ability to keep, but that didn't matter because people remembered his more famous uncle and believed that he would follow through on some of those promises. And so once he became president of France, he tried the, his best to follow the, follow in the steps of his uncle and he greatly expanded his power he used his uh, broad electoral victory to stack parliament with his uh, with his favorite with his favorites, and then he started uh, purging the government and consolidating power to himself. Eventually, just like his uncle had, he held a national referendum, and he became Emperor Napoleon the Third, and the friend the Second French Republic turned into the Second French Empire. This wasn't necessarily bad for France, as Napoleon III did do some things that were beneficial. One, he, he built huge new open boulevards in Paris, both to help people move around the city and to make sure that those urban barricades that overthrew the last two uh, leaders of France would not be effective anymore. He also pursued overseas colonial ambitions, invading Mexico, as we remember yesterday, getting involved in wars in Italy and Turkey, and also consolidating control over Northern Africa, which France had, had tried to grab about 20 years previously. And so in some ways, he returned France to glory. In other ways, he mirrored his uncle, he took away people's, the people's right to vote, and all elements of socialism or sort of the government providing for people are going to vanish under Napoleon III. So that's your second French empire. The same time that Louis Philippe is getting overthrown in France, Metternich gets overthrown in Vienna. A student protest grows out of hand, and, met, and uh, they end up joining together with groups of disaffected workers. And this violent mob storms the government capital and forces the Emperor of Prussia to dis uh, the Emperor of Austria to dismiss Metternich from office. Metternich's fall kicks off a, a, a massive explosion throughout Europe. Because if the arch conservative Clements von Metternich can be kicked from power by radical demonstrations, 
what else could other people accomplish? And now there's no one to lead the conservative response to crush these revolutions. So with that, revolutions break out across Austria, across uh, the Russian Empire, across Italy, which we'll talk about uh, tomorrow, and across Germany, where groups of German-speaking peoples imagine the creation of a German nation state. And so they get together, they elect their own representative government, and they start trying to create a united Germany. In order to create this Germany, they ask the king of Prussia, the most powerful of the German-speaking states, to become the king of Germany. But the parliament at Frankfurt has some stipulations. The king of Prussia, Friedrich Wilhelm, has to accept a constitution that limits his power. Friedrich Wilhelm is an absolute ruler who doesn't have any constitutional limits on his power. And so the idea of becoming emperor of Germany is one that is somewhat appealing to him, but limiting his power is absolutely unacceptable. And so he raises the massive Prussian army, crushes these revolutionaries, and refuses to accept this crown from the gutter, as he calls it. But the dream of German unification will live on. So revolt crushed, but Germany is not united yet. And in Austria, Hungarians, led by Lajos Kossuth, who you don't need to know, try to rise up to create their own nation state. They create an army, they march on Vienna, and there was some potential chance of these, Aust of these Hungarians winning and breaking away from the Austrian Empire when the great conservative power Russia finally stirs itself. The Emperor of Austria asks the Emperor of Russia from help for help. The Russian army mobilizes, and they march in and crush all the revolutions of 1848. So the Russian army sweeps through Europe, putting down these revolutions and ensuring that the conservative powers are again ascendant. So revolution has failed for now, but all of these revolutions continue to spread these ideas of nationalism, liberalism, radicalism, and the people who supported these things are not gone. They're just biding their time and waiting for the next opportunity to attempt to assert their rights. We start to see these ideas of nationalism spread. Hungarians start writing national anthems that sound very much like La Marseillaise in France. And so you get these attempts to unite and create these new nation states, which will eventually provide a national homeland for the various ethnic groups in Europe. This brings us back to our objectives. Hopefully, you can answer all these questions in some detail. And when we come back tomorrow, we'll look at how these ideas spread specifically to Italy and zoom in a little bit to explore the story there, explaining how the Italians eventually put together their own nation state.